Hello, welcome once again to Leto's Law. I'm Steve Leto. Today we're going to talk about the idea that not all judges in America have law degrees. And is that a problem? <laughs> well, it popped up in this way. Uh, recently I saw it in the, uh, on the internet. But a guy named Matt Ford, who's a writer for The Atlantic, uh, wrote an article called When Your Judge Isn't a Lawyer. And he points out that this is actually more common than most people think it is. So, for instance, I'm licensed to practice law in Michigan. And to be a judge in Michigan to get elected, you have to have a law degree and five years of legal practice just to be qualified to get yourself on the ballot. But it didn't always used to be that way. And in fact, as you can imagine, back when America was you know, still expanding into frontier areas and territories and so on, that there might be times where a small town doesn't even have any lawyers in town, let alone somebody who wants to sit and be a judge. So it was fairly common in the old days. You'd have a justice of the peace with no legal training, but you find a guy in town or a gal in town who people trust, and you say, you get to decide all of our debates, <laughs> and we'll give you a room over here, and we'll call it a courthouse or something. But uh, as times have gone on, you'd think, well, haven't we kind of fixed all that? Well, as he points out, that uh, in some states, justices of the peace don't need a law degree to put defendants behind bars. But if you want to be, for instance, a massage therapist in Helena, Montana, you need 500 hours of study. Uh, to be a barber in Billings, you need 1,500 hours. Uh, but a, to be a state justice of the peace, all you need is a four-day certification course. So it turns out that it's easier to become at least qualified to be a magistrate there than to become, say, a barber. So here's the thing. They don't require a law degree, just approval of the voters. So you, you, you get elected and you're in. Uh, now, Montana's rules are not the norm in America, but they're not unheard of. Again, according to Matt Ford, 28 states require all judges presiding over misdemeanor cases to be lawyers, including large states like California and Florida. Uh, in 14 of the remaining 22 states, a defendant who receives a jail sentence from a non-lawyer judge has the right to seek a new trial before a lawyer judge. Uh, it's like a two-step system. And I've mentioned before that in Michigan, for instance, if you get a civil infraction ticket, you can ask for an informal hearing, which if you lose, you can then immediately appeal to a formal hearing. So it's kind of like, you know, you get two swings at this, you know, at this thing. So it's always worth doing. But the problem is, when it's a criminal situation, do you want to waste your time going through the first trial in front of somebody who's not qualified, probably, <laughs> to get yourself to the second trial, and what a hellacious waste of time that could be. Um, Montana and seven other states, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, New York, Texas, South Carolina, and Wyoming, allow non-lawyer judges to hand down jail sentences for misdemeanors without the right to a new trial before a lawyer judge. Some states like Montana only allow the practice in rural or sparsely populated counties, while others allow it statewide. So now you might be thinking, well, Steve, maybe these, these states out west are just doing what they did in the old days. That is, it's so sparsely populated, they can't find somebody who wants to be judge who's qualified. Well, it turns out that's not the case. Um, the uh, Montana situation is troubling, again, according to Matt Ford, uh, because the non-lawyer judges being used, it's not from the earlier era, but it's a recent attempt to save money. From uh, at least 1895 until the 21st century, Montana guaranteed defendants tried before non-lawyers uh, to a new trial before a lawyer judge. But then in 2003, state lawmakers tweaked the state's rules to allow counties to exclude themselves from that right by designating the justice courts as courts of record. A state senator told his colleagues while introducing the bill, it'll provide cost savings to the people of Montana at every level. Again... Cost savings for taxpayers are nice, but if you're the person standing in front of that unqualified magistrate judge, don't you wish they spent a little more money to get one with training? <laughs> so there are all kinds of constitutional issues raised here, and believe it or not, this has gotten to the U.S. Supreme Court at least once. In 1972, the U.S. Supreme Court heard North versus Russell, a challenge to Kentucky's two-tier judicial system they used at the time, in which cities with more than 100,000 residents, had to use lawyer judges in their municipal courts, um, but the smaller places apparently didn't. Uh, the defendant challenged the jail sentence he received from a judge who was a coal miner with no legal education. Uh, Chief Justice Warren Berger led a majority to uphold the arrangement in a dry opinion, 
citing North's procedural ability to seek a new trial before a lawyer judge. And now the funny thing, though, is that, as the dissenters pointed out in that opinion, to get that trial, he apparently would have had to go into the first trial and plead guilty. And then once he'd been found guilty, he would then be allowed to go and ask for a new trial in front of the second qualified judge, who, of course, the first thing he's going to ask is, wait, didn't you just plead guilty previously? So that's a problem. Uh, And some people point out that the history that you should be allowed to get in front of a qualified judge doesn't just go to our Constitution and your right to a fair trial. It goes back even further than that. And so the Magna Carta, uh, he points out, was the document signed in 1215 by King John. And many people point to that as one of the earliest foundational things in Western jurisprudence. Uh, I like to go back to the Code of Hammurabi myself, but that's not Western jurisprudence. And um, in the Magna Carta, King John promised that he would not make any justices, constables, sheriffs, or bailiffs accepting of such as know the laws of the land. So in other words, he promised that those people that he appointed to be judges and so on would be qualified and they would know the law. So here's the thing. I've talked before about the Italian Hall disaster where I wrote a book about uh, the tragedy that took place in Calumet, Michigan. 73 people died in a stampede to get out of a building when somebody falsely yelled fire. There was no fire. And the man who's brought in to oversee the inquest into that event was a coroner. And the coroner at that time didn't have to have medical training. So this man had no medical training and he was ruling on the causes of death. Completely botched the job, unqualified person. And the funny thing is that his other job was he was also a justice of the peace with no legal training. So he was unqualified for both of his jobs. But that's how it was back in the old days in, you know, on the frontiers. And I understand that the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in 1913 wasn't really the frontier of like the wild, wild west. But there were not a lot of attorneys up there or a lot of attorneys who wanted to be judges and so on. So the problem is if you can't find somebody qualified, then yeah, you lower the standards and bring in somebody who's now qualified under the new standards. But here's the thing. I mentioned before that Michigan requires judges to have a law degree and five years of experience before they run for judge. That wasn't always the case. In fact, the law changed while I was an attorney. In 1996, five years after I got my law license, the Michigan Constitution was amended to require that before you could run for judge, you had to have a law degree and five years of legal experience uh, as an attorney. So the interesting thing is the way our Constitution is written, it says you can't run for judge. But if you're already on the bench, and believe it or not, at that moment in time when that law got changed, I seem to recall there were at least two judges who had simply been there before the law changed who had no legal training and they simply ran for judge and they got elected now here's the thing i know there's people out there right now who are saying steve but wouldn't our legal system possibly benefit if the right people were appointed judges and they're smart and they're fair and they might not know the law but they have a sense of justice or they understand the community or or something and here's the thing I see what you're getting at, but the problem is that the law is too complicated for that. And I'll get to that in a situation in a second, but I'll be honest. If you said, Steve, can you name for me a person who's not a a judge that you would actually entrust a legal problem to and and say this person can be the arbiter? They can actually make the decision on this case. Yeah, I can think of a few people that I would trust to do that. But of course, does the other side who I'm disputing with, will they agree to that same person? Uh... But again, what's really the problem is that our law is is too complicated for somebody who's got no legal training. And I'm going to give you an example. And I know there's attorneys in the audience, but I'm I'm trying to give an example that non-attorneys will understand. So in the courtroom system, okay, a judge has got to oversee a court and oversee trials. And so a trial's taking place. There's a witness on the stand. And the attorney doing the direct asks the witness, did so-and-so tell you something? You don't need to be an attorney to know the other side's going to jump up and object and go, hearsay, I object, that is hearsay, it calls for a hearsay answer, your honor. And the attorney will then look at the judge and the judge will then look at the other attorney and say, how do you respond to the objection? Does this in fact call for a hearsay answer? And the interesting thing is that Michigan's courtrooms, among other things, are ruled by the rules of evidence, Michigan's rules of evidence, MRE. MRE 802 specifically says, hearsay is not admissible except as provided by these rules. Except as provided by these rules. So you go, wait a second. The rule says it's not admissible, 
Except, there's exceptions? Oh, you bet there are. So 802 is the hearsay rule. 803 is the hearsay exceptions rule. And I'm just going to let you know right now that there are 24 numbered exceptions to the hearsay rule. So let me give you an example. Uh, the guy in the stand is a doctor. And he testifies that one night, late at night, somebody comes running up to his door, banging on his door, Doc, 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 I need help. And the doctor swings the door open, and there's a man bleeding, and he goes, I've been shot in the leg. I've been shot in the leg. So there's an exception. Statements made for purposes of medical treatment or medical diagnosis in connection with treatment. So the doctor could be asked, you heard a knock at the door. Did you answer the knock at the door? Did you open the door? What did you encounter next? I encountered this guy. What did he say to you? Perfectly admissible. He said, doc, doc, I need your help. Help me. I've been shot or whatever it was exactly that I said. Okay. That's a statement made for purposes of medical treatment or medical diagnosis. And it is absolutely admissible despite being hearsay. Okay. It is hearsay, but it's an exception. And you might say, Steve, wait, why do we outlaw hearsay, but we allow all these exceptions? There's a reason for it. Because hearsay is designed to keep out unreliable statements or people who don't remember things. But there are obviously situations where, where the hearsay would make sense. Do you have any doubt that a guy who runs up to a doctor's house and he knows there's a doctor living there for some reason, he's pounding on the door with a gunshot wound in his leg, and the guy swings the door open and he goes, Doc, I've been shot, help me. Do you really think that the statement that guy's making is not true? Okay, what, did he fake the gunshot? I mean, he could have, but the point is... That's probably what we call, you know, a more believable statement than simply, oh, I overheard the guy say such and such. So that's one exception to the hearsay rule. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these rules are right or wrong. I'm pointing out that they exist, but you've got to know the rules exist. So I'll give you another example. Let's suppose that someone is on the stand and they're testifying in a case of bigamy, in a case of bigamy, okay? And uh, that is somebody's accused of already having been married, and then they got married to a second person. <laughs> Generally, you can't do, at least in most states of America. And you put a person on the stand and you say, uh, you know, I, I, we've called you here. What do you do? They say, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a clerk. I work for the records department of this county. And I say, did you bring any documents with you today? And you say, yeah, I brought a document with me today. And I say, what is it? And they say, it is a certified record from the courthouse uh, or the clerk's office that indicates it's a marriage license. And I go, what does the document say? And of course, you're going to get the objection. That's hearsay because you're calling, in essence, for a statement made by somebody other than the witness. And it's going to not be the document speaking, but whoever filled the document out. But if we got it certified, we don't need the actual person who filled it out there. It's another story altogether. But the point is that you're going to get an objection hearsay. That, that's an out-of-court statement being trying to be, you know. And, and by the way, most attorneys wouldn't make these objections because they know the rules so well. But let's suppose you make that objection and the judge then turns to the other attorney and goes, what, you know, why is this not hearsay? And they'll say, well, Your Honor, it doesn't matter whether it's hearsay or not because exception 12 to rule 803 says, marriage, baptismal, and similar certificates, statements of fact contained in a certificate that the maker performed a marriage or other ceremony or administered a sacrament made by a member of the clergy public official or other person authorized by the rules or practices of a religious organization or by law to perform the act certified and purporting to have been issued at the time of the act or within a reasonable time thereafter, those are admissible. It's absolutely admissible, even if it was hearsay. So you go, wow, Steve, that's kind of complicated. You've got a hearsay rule that says you can't admit stuff, but then you've got 24 exceptions that say you can. And I say, oh, that's not all of it, though. Because rule 803A also includes exceptions to the hearsay rule. And Rule 804 contains two more pages of exceptions to the hearsay rule. And you say, Steve, it sounds like those exceptions are swallowing the rule. And in many respects, they are. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you, if you're thinking about going to law school or taking a bar exam, you're going to understand that evidence is one of the major things you're going to study. The bar exam is going to have several questions on hearsay because it's such a complicated set of rules. You know, understand what is hearsay, what isn't hearsay, when is it admissible, what are the exceptions. Uh, the two groups of exceptions are broken down, whether or not the person who made the original statement is available or not. Meaning that sometimes if that person who made the statement is alive and available, you got to bring them in and make, have them make the statement. 
But the summer doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. And again, these are all exceptions to one rule. And as you can imagine, rule 803, they started numbering those rules back at, back at 100. So there's a big collection of rules. And that's simply the court rules. That's not even describing you know, the, the, the rules of civil procedure, which fall under a different group of rules. And then, of course, the substantive law in the case in question. So in other words, if it's a murder case, the judge has got to understand all the stuff about murder. If it's an embezzlement case, the judge has got to understand all the stuff about embezzlement. And many courts will not only hear criminal cases, but they'll hear civil cases. They might hear landlord-tenant cases. They might hear divorce cases. They might hear all kinds of stuff. And the idea that we can simply grab a person off the street and they can win an election and now they're qualified to sit and oversee trials is, to me, insane. So I, I find it very unusual, but like I said, we got rid of this in Michigan uh, in 1996 for the most part, and most states, as more than half, I believe, uh, have done away with it, but the people in the other half, <laughs> you're still dealing with it. So it's something you might want to look into, the fact that you could show up in front of a judge or a magistrate who isn't a lawyer. As always, questions or comments, fire my way. Otherwise, talk to you later. Bye-bye.